Hey guys. Hey. Good to see you both. It's you know it's been since 2020. Hey John, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Has it been that long? It has. I looked. I I I did a search on. Because Eric is like a ninja when it comes to the internet. They can't find him on the internet. He's a secret, mm. he's a secret agent out there. Um, it's true, Eric. Admit it. Just admit that you're a secret agent. And then, you know. Um, and, uh, and then I saw, it was like, I think it was like the fall of 2020 when last we sat together. Here we are. I know. There is an. I apologize in advance. There is an odd sort of warbling sound that comes up, which is my voice, but it's not my voice. That's my. That's my. That's my preamble. Cursor. So Eric, uh, it's so I, I I talk to Jamie and I bump into Jamie from time to time because we're on the same coast. I don't I don't get the luxury with you. Um, how, how are how are things going for you? Well, I've been fine. I've for the last year and a half, but I just want to get rid of it. It's almost finished. Uh, it's, it has nothing to do with comics uh, or illustration, really. It's I've been writing a nonfiction book on the history of a stage show from 1913. I don't remember whether I mentioned this. In a past, podcast, you, you did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I've been caught in this project forever, and it is uh, just want to get out of it anyway. Um, it is, uh, there was this uh, musical musical show called The TikTok Man of Oz, written by L. Frank Baum, the creator of the Oz books. And I did a revival of it at an Oz convention in 2014, so I had to restore the script and the score. And I wrote this article for the program book. And a few years later, I wanted to print the script and the score. And my partner, David, said, well, why don't you just print your article as a, as a, as a third volume in this, in this project? I said, oh, that's a great idea. But I need to do a little bit of updating. <laughs> I got it wrong. And I wanted a few more images. Of course, now, like three years later, oh, finally, I'm almost done doing the layout of the book. Wow. And it is, oh, I'm very, I'm proud of the work I've done. Um, I've had to do some uh, real primary research, delving back into old newspaper archives and finding photographs. I, last month, I, one of the chorus girls in this show, her name was Lenore Peters. Her married name was Lenore Job. She became a, uh, major figure in modern dance in San Francisco in the 20th century. Um, and so she died in 1984. Uh, her, her autobiography was published a few months before she died. And uh, she was a very, she was more important than just being a chorus girl in the show for six months at one point in her, in her life. And so I go, well, should I, do I need to find her biography? And I look on the internet and the only copy I could find for sale was like 200 bucks. I'm like, I, I'm not spending that kind of money right. just for the chance that maybe she mentioned this show in passing in her autobiography, because it certainly would, couldn't have been a very important part of her life. But I go, oh, well, you know, I'll try to draw a library loan. Got a, I, you know, submitted a hold a request. And the next week I got an email from my local <laughs> public library branch saying, yeah, we have it, have it in. Come pick it up. So I picked it up. And I'm like, in the parking lot after checking it out, like I'm I wonder if there's anything in here. I know some four pages that she wrote on this being in this show. Oh wow! So I'm like, wow, this is great material. Um, some of it confirms. Uh, I had to make you know, sir, I had to put things together from various sources, and some of it confirmed conclusions that I had made in about this show, and some of it gave me like new information. She was a chorus girl, so she gave a brief description of the dressing room. With these other, uh, when they appeared in Chicago, the producer hired six professional showgirls who were much more experienced than all of these other chorus girls who, 
the show started in Los Angeles. So they were, they made a point of hiring California women to be in the show. And California was not the center of the theater world at the time. Right. Okay. So we went to Chicago, which was a much more, uh, I mean, the East New York was the center of the theater world, theater world as it all, as it is today. And, uh, Chicago was was a major theater city. Um, once they got to Chicago, they hired these six showgirls who were much more experienced. So um, Lenore Peters, in this in in her description of working on the show, talks about being in the dressing room with these much more experienced showgirls. Anyway, just you know, it's nothing. And and she discusses why the the show never got to Broadway, so it was considered a failure. Um, it was moderate, moderately successful. It toured for 10 months um, around the US and Canada. But she she gives a very astute uh, a, a summary of, of why it failed, which was because the New York producers did not want the competition from the West Coast. Oh. And out. So how much, like, how, like, I guess from what you walked into the project, you know, on paper, what did it what did it sort of grow into from the sort of David's suggestion of hey why don't you make it a book and then fast forward a year and a half like what is the like what is the growth from that? Well, uh, I had written an article on the history of the show for the program book at the convention that yeah. originally did the revival at, and that just covered sort of casting and and the history of the show where it where it was the schedule and whatever I, and a little bit of biography of all the people involved uh, for this for this expanded book uh, i went back in l frank Baum's lifetime gave a brief overview of his career in the in the theater because he originally wanted to be an actor and then got into writing um so he was involved in the theater all his life i give a brief overview of that but then his biggest hit on stage was a uh, Broadway musical version of The Wizard of Oz, premiered in 1902 in Chicago, went to Broadway in 1903, and then was his, one of the biggest hits of the first decade of the 20th century. It's forgotten now. Um, so that made him a, a very, very wealthy man. But when he closed, he, uh, he had to declare bankruptcy within a couple of years and was like, because he was like spending at the, I thought he was like rich for a while and, you know, traveling the world and living at the Hotel Del Coronado, which is this resort uh, yeah. hotel in San Diego. And then that's where he spent his winters. And then his summers, he was on, he, he had a resort home in Lake Makatawa, Michigan, which was across the, across the Michigan from Chicago. And living a high life. Uh, when the show, when the Wizard of Oz closed in 1909, suddenly his income stream is largely cut off. He owes money. He owes thousands of dollars to people, and he declares bankruptcy. Uh, so uh, he was always trying to chase the next big stage hit because it's like it was like I mean theater back then was like movies today. You get a movie deal, sure. and you know you're set. Uh, so that's what this project was. The Black Man of Oz it was his a. He, there were several attempts, and this was his latest attempt to uh, capitalize on on his uh, popularity of the Wizard of Oz and extend it for the for as long as he could make that go, and it didn't really work. Um, so I had to delve back into that motivation, and this project went through many many different stages, uh, and influenced a lot of his books because he would take pieces of works of, we'd write a script for a project that eventually down the line became a project and then it would change. So we'd take bits of the old project and put them into his books. And then he would draw bits of other books that he'd written and put them into the next stage of this show. So um, I just traced all that. It's it's a complicated scheme. I actually made a, a visual flow chart okay. of all all these projects going down and everything, like half the stuff he ever worked on in his life was influenced by this show or either influenced this show. Plus uh, works by other people. Uh, he was hired to write 
a stage show by Edith Ogden Harrison, who was the wife of Chicago's mayor. She had wrote she wrote children's books and she wanted to put one of them on stage. So, he, so, she, so she she hired him to write the scenario and then the script of his show. And that show never never got onto the stage, but he took Baum took bits of what he had brought to that show and then used it in other other works of his, including this show. It's so it's so interesting because I'm sorry. I go no, on and on. It, it's it's so interesting because like you know, I, Jamie, you and I were talking about this the, the other week. The idea like how there's so many people in the comic industry, you know, in recent years, like chasing that sort of that Hollywood money with a comic book. You know, like like this will be the big thing that's going to get me on on TV or in a movie, and like, but this is 120 years ago. And he was doing the same thing, but just with a different, you know, just different medium. Yeah, I think you you start researching stuff back in uh, just like the history of entertainment. And it's the same conversation that we've been having for the last hundreds of years, right? It's no. the exact same thing. It, nothing, nothing changes. Comic books have been dying since they started, right? right. <laughs> Theater... Theater has always been the competition of the new media that's coming out, the television, the radio, right? Sure. Like it's, it's, everything is always the same. Uh, it's, it's hilarious. Yeah. You know, it's, it's also interesting. It like, not that this is like completely in there, but the idea that like the radio, the radio show wasn't, a, didn't start until what the teens and the twenties. That's so sounds, that sounds right. Right. So, but television was only 20 years after that. So yeah. like, like we think of this period of like, oh, well, you know, TV came and destroyed the, the, the radio industry, but it, it's not like it would have been there for like, you know, you know, a hundred years. Yeah. Everything, it just moves. Everything's moving so quickly. Once yeah. you get any kind of reproduction of anything, right. then, then, the 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 speed at which technology enhances and goes uh is is definitely <laughs> right just the technology of the times make everything so much shorter for sure but like but theater and film sort of don't sort of go out of vogue in a sense like they're both like they both have their entrenched sort of position and it's they they are they sort of have this sort of high level well, you, I think, and now let's go to get a little esoteric. Um, theater now is ostensibly just art, art, right? It's sure. it's it's not necessarily catering to the masses. It is catering to it's similar to fine art, right? You have people who are uh, who have wealth going to view the opera, going to view Shakespeare, right? This is stuff that is. Uh, no longer necessarily for for the common man. Theater has has kind of taken a dip, and I think we're seeing a similar thing with the quote unquote avant garde film uh, in in uh, in the in the movie theater too, right? Like it's starting to go. You get more and more high art in it's sectioning off the mm -hmm. the the. We're in comics is the same thing, right? It's slowly becoming less and less. We have superhero comics, and then we have art comics, and there's the the divide is constantly growing. Yeah, um, and I think that's the same thing with like young readership, like entertainment written for children and entertainment written for adults. The divide is becoming larger and larger too, and so I think that's a a th just a product of I. I information technology i don't really know no it's just it's, it's accessibility too yeah accessibility totally and like i mean what you're talking about eric is like the shows that you're talking about in your in your book are the mass media of the time you know this uh, is it's pre-radio pre-television this is how you can get a you know 200 people in the same space to experience the same thing you know, in a repeatable fashion, you know, it's not like, you know, like a juggling act, like it's not gonna be the same amount of like 
tosses in the air, like this is a very sort of spe specified, you know, and choreographed element. It's a show. Um, but it's so, but then like, you know, radio comes in and sort of kind of people are like, well, we don't have to go out, mama. We can stay at home and listen to this, this, this radio play. Did it's also cheaper. Movies were already becoming, uh, you know, very popular. There were movie houses, mm -hmm. movies. Happen. I think, I mean, I'm not an expert on the movies, but when Let's did they start? We are. 1890, what? Let's pretend we're all experts in this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> movies were becoming popular, say, by 1910, but they were still seen as sort of novelty of things. Yeah. But movie theaters had started, you know, vaudeville would show movies as part of the bill uh, by 1920. By well, 1915, I mean, Hollywood was pretty well started, had been started going. And by 1920, it was well entrenched. Yeah. By, 19, by 1925, I mean, movies were a thing that everybody went to. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and then the Depression hit in the 30s and vaudeville died and theater was still popular enough and hung up for a while as a popular art form. But I don't know, 100 years later now. Yeah, it's. Well, it's like, you know, it's this thing. I remember when I was teaching at in the late 90s and we had we had a photography you know curriculum at the school and we had these great photographers and teachers and they would all be doing film photography and i kept going like there's digital cameras out now like we're we're in the age where this is the this is what is going to be the medium for this what you're doing commercially and it, it's the same thing like the second the digital version of whatever it is the what it's replacing becomes the art form. So film on, you know, image on film becomes the art form while the image on data becomes the thing we put out in the world for, you know, money. And, and it's sort of similar in that sense, like the thing on stage was the thing that was the consumer product, but then radio and film come along and sort of make it a much easier way to tell the same story over and over to many more people. So now, you know, stage goes, well, let's, what else can we do? And that's when you're saying the art comes in, you know, Jamie is like, when we start getting people going like, well, let's tell stories. Let's tell a story that we can't tell on a, you know, on a, on a screen. Yeah. Figuring out ways to actually communicate what the art form actually is able to do versus what, uh, you know, a one story can be translated from one place to one place to one place. But there is something palpable about seeing like Macbeth on stage versus seeing a film of Macbeth. There is a difference. There's a huge difference. Huge difference. So, but okay. So, but this actually, like, I could, this actually syncs up really well. Of you know, in the terms of like both of you, like Eric, you don't sit. You know, you're not doing superhero comic books. You know, like you were. You know, thirty years ago. You know, like the, you're you're chasing the story and the art that you're interested in, and making that stuff. And same with you, Jamie. You're not you're not really playing to the, you know, to the back seats. Going like, hey, look at my grimacing character with you know weapons and whatever. You know, um, do, do you guys? I mean, do you? I mean, do, you, do either one of you like sort of like realize that like recognize that in your in your sort of your your creative process no nice <laughs> Sorry, no. nice um, yes no to some extent yeah. yes i've always been chasing the idea of i want to write and draw comics that i that come from a place within me rather than accept some uh, job that some editor calls up and says, would you do this? Mm -hmm. But all along in my career, I have done both things. Yeah. Uh, now I'm doing, I guess I'm doing less of some editor calling up and saying, do you want to do this? But it's because they just don't call anymore. Because, <laughs> you know, someone, someone called up and said, hey, we have this superhero story. For you to draw and it's a one-shot because i don't want to get involved in something engaged 
yeah. that, that is that is like where I will draw the line. I'm not going to take a monthly book. Right. I'm not. I'm not going to let that swamp the rest of my career. Uh, but sure, yeah, I draw that. I mean, I drew some uh, superhero cover. The last work I, superhero work I did was like less than a year ago. I drew some cover uh, for a very small company. Uh, if I can even remember the name of it, it was but the same in the book was Lynx. Uh, uh -huh. some, some some small company full of people who are established professionals. I, I don't know all their names, who, who they all were. Uh, and, but I don't know, I am not up on exactly what's coming out or what's going on in the industry. So I don't yeah, even know me neither. what's happening. Uh, I'm, it's I'm getting problem. less and less, I less and less know what's going on in the industry. Yeah. I'm becoming more and more of a hermit and more and more of a guy who's just can sit in his house and make stories. Apparently yeah. that's part of youth. Well, that's not very good because I thought we were going to talk about like our own imprints and publicity. Well, that I mean, but this I guess, is a, yeah. <laughs> but we are, but we are. To, I mean, I guess this does lead into the idea of your own imprint because I mean, you know, when when the world doesn't make the thing that you want, you know, creators. That's when creators create the thing that they want. So I mean, it's it's a sim it's a simple equation. That's why we see so many you know, rock stars making it big when they're young because they're like, I don't hear the music I I want to hear. So they make the music. And then other people go like, I like this too. And, you know, we get these sort of, you know, the the enfant terrible and, you know, and whatever the sort of the art form it is. And that that's the the model. But, you know, you can, you can kind of like also have a career and then eventually go like, I really want to do the thing that I want to do. But sometimes you have to say, I'm just going to do it myself and I'm going to make my own imprint. I'm going to run my own thing and I'm going to put it out there and figure it out, which Derek, you've been doing for some time and Jamie, you're like on this road of doing it. So um, had, like, was there a sort of a moment for you, Eric and like, and, and Jamie, like, did you both have a moment? I don't know. I don't know if I've told this story on the podcast, but I was doing. Uh, I tell the story a lot. I was doing uh, sample pages for Marvel and DC, and and trying to get all of that stuff out into the world. And an editor took me aside at a convention and told me I was a great storyteller, but maybe change the way I draw eyes and. Uh, and then maybe they would hire me. Mm -hmm. I, and I was like, that's something I could fix in the moment. Uh, that's a very easy thing to say. And then I realized, I was like, oh, these big companies aren't necessarily in the storytelling world. It, that's not what they're they're trying to put out. So I decided that next day. That happened on a Saturday night at a convention. Sunday, I uh, went up to some of my friends who were doing self-published work. And I said... I'm just going to start making my own stuff. And they all went, okay, good. When you, when you have it, send it to us. Uh, and that was the breaking point for me was, uh, you know, you, I think I had been trying to break in to the industry for five years at that point mm -hmm. with varying levels of success. But then when I said, I'm just going to go off and do this on my own and make my own stuff, I started getting more work for some more like work for higher work. Right. Because I just had, I had stuff I could show people, you know, like here's, here's an issue that I did by myself. And then people were like, Oh, this guy can actually do an issue of comics. Great. <laughs> we'll hire him. Yeah. Uh, and that's been, and that was gosh, four, four years ago now. Yeah. And, so, and I've been doing the baboon stuff for three years now, which is crazy. Yeah doing anything for a period of it but of course Eric, how long you've been doing your 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 age of bronze age of bronze well i've been working it's been published since 90 eight seven eight 98 yeah yeah and i've been working on it no it's been published since 97 no 98 i can't remember sorry <laughs> anyway late 90s I've been working on it since the early 90s, though. 
Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's like, I think everybody has like, who makes that has like the, there, there is sort of like kind of like that one passion thing that is always going to be around in your, in your creative thing. Although Eric, you sort of have two, I guess, in, in a sense. <laughs> I just have whatever I, you know, whatever I like at the moment. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just like, you know, I liked odds since I was a kid. I didn't like right. the Trojan war when I was a kid. I liked the Trojan war when I was an adult. So, uh, you know, it's just different points in my life. I'm right. Sure I never get done with, when I get done with Age of Bronze, if I still have, you know, the ability to move my hand <laughs> at that point, uh, because I'll be so old, uh, uh, it'll be something else. Yeah. And stuff pops up along the way that I'm like, oh, I want to work on this because I always have multiple projects going. That's, that is, that is, I, that might be the number one thing, like for a creator, is that thing that pops up. That's the hardest thing to like, how do you, how do you incorporate the thing that pops up into your, you know, so it doesn't distract you from the thing that you're doing, you know, like, because you have a pipeline, we all have a creative pipeline and it's all of a sudden this thing comes up and you're like, how does this thing, like you, like you did this book, Eric, you know, and this book is like, took a year and a half of your, your sanity. Yeah, it's not, it's not good. <laughs> uh, it's derailed a lot of other stuff, uh, but I'm just at this point. I'm just I all my spare time, all my time is just going to get it done because I have to get it done right as soon as possible. Right, I just, it needs to be done. I have other things that are screaming for my attention, and I have to get to them. Things yeah. that I care about somewhat more. <laughs> not that I don't care about this book, but it wasn't like it's not. It wasn't a passion. It wasn't a passion to write the history of this show. It's like if I don't do it, no one else is going to do it. So I'm going to do it, and I have to do it well. So I committed to it, and then I just have to get it done. Right. So that's yes, that's a very that's a thing that every creator has to manage in their in their lives. What do you spend your time on? What's worth spending your time on? We all have a finite amount of time on this earth. And there's so much in life besides work. I mean, there are other people out there, there's society. You, you have to interact with that to some extent. We can, we can be hermits, but you can't. If you want to uh, draw comics and get them out there for other people to read, you cannot be a total hermit. Yeah, I mean, you can't, yeah, you can't definitely be like a dilettante to just hop around. It's. I would love to have. You know, the problem with comics is if it doesn't pay enough money to hire anybody to do anything for you, because I, I need a secretary. I need a secretary. I need a publicist. I need someone to run. You know, figure out my paperwork and crap like that. I don't have time for all that and work too. But I don't make enough money on my work to like hire anybody to take care of this other stuff. I need interns. Yeah. I I, I had I had some guy who wanted to be my intern back about oh about 15 years ago. I'm like, great. Um he wanted he wanted to like you know learn what I did, like observe my work process and stuff. I'm like, great, I don't You'll do this a few for a few hours a week, and I. It worked for like a few weeks, and then he says, "I can't really do this anymore." <laughs> <laughs> I'd well, love an it? intern. That'd be great. Just someone to scan pages. That would be awesome. Yes, yes. I talk to all these kids, and they're all working digitally, and I'm like, ugh. Yeah, I hate you because they don't have to scan. They don't have to like the part that they don't have to do. They don't have to scan pages. These well, these yeah. young kids and their computers. Well, no, it's no, no. This is so. This I mean, this is I mean, I, I, I so real world stuff. Like I was working in design for in nineteen ninety nine, and the power went off. Like the whole area in Atlanta, no power, but we still had to get things done because we had to deliver things to the clients. So we're all doing things manually, do, doing paste ups, getting things prepared because we can't just sit around and go, well, when the power comes on, we can get back to work. Like it was just get it done. So we get it done. 
And I remember I was teaching at the time at the Creative Circus and the, the student like we had this whole discussion. I was teaching a drawing class and the student was like, I don't need to know how to do this kind of stuff. And I was like, well, what if the power goes out? Because he's like, I can just do all this on Photoshop. Like, well, what if the power goes out? Like the client doesn't care. They need to see whatever it is that your company has to deliver on time. And, and, and it was just like, it was just this fortuitous timing. So, um, I mean, you're at a, you have a school nearby. I'm sure you could get, you know, this, you know, someone to come in for credit and they could do the, the grunt work of that kind of stuff and learn the process, even though they might only be working on an iPad. Or, oh, are you're talking well, to me? Yes, yeah. I do have a school nearby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, no, none of those kids care uh, about, about uh, like, that's the other thing. A lot of them don't think about working traditionally at all. Right. Um, so like, there are some, I, I, and I have become, I have made friends with the ones that do like that kind of stuff. But a lot of them, you know, they, they're, they're, the things that they're looking at and the stuff that they're trying to do are uh, vastly different than anything anything we will ever do or achieve. It's uh, their entry point to comics is just such a different. It's it's different just entirely. Um, and it's you know it's like it also it goes back to the whole sort of you know. Uh, commercial versus art factor, you know, because you're choosing to do stuff on paper with a pencil and a pen, that is no, no longer the sort of the, of the day commercial, you know, version. Yeah. The commercial version, you know, is, you know, this thing. Like, that's how people are doing their comic books. Yeah. And I've thought about doing it because I want to do my my dream Ooh. is to do a daily strip right because <laughs> i think i think i'm built for daily strips okay i think uh i think i'm i think i'm actually built for it okay um, but doing that and then up scanning pages coloring it uploading it seems like it would take forever when i could just draw it on an ipad and click upload right like <laughs> there's the, the time save to yeah. do something daily um would is but i don't know i like drawing on paper too much like i i, I say I, I was about to say like well there's no award for you know the, the guy who drew it on paper and inked it with a pen or a brush award but there probably is um but the point being is like you know like they say like nobody gives you an award for not taking your vacation days so like right. maybe like, maybe like for the project like if you just looked at it on the design level like maybe doing comic book pages you do them traditionally but if you were to do a strip just to save that you know 45 minutes a day or whatever it would be you could just get it done um yeah yeah it's it's a weird it's a weird thing to consider as a tool that i was never I'm, I'm i never considered it like i color digitally but it's i still color digitally in like a really not efficient way uh it takes me i can draw a 20 page comic pencil and inks in like two weeks and then it takes me the other two weeks of the month to color the thing it's it's not it's a slow process right. for me. um how do you, Eric, how do you color your, you, I mean, like you're not, you, the age of bronze is coming back out, but somebody else is coloring that. Um, but do you color, do you do, do anything like digitally? Like, do you color anything digitally or do you do it all traditionally? Well, I, I, yeah, I do some color digitally. Yeah. Uh, I do all the covers for the, for, the more recent Age of Bronze covers, I'll well, I draw them, but then I color them digitally. Right. I, uh, I uh, do all the layouts of everything digitally because everyone needs a PDF, not paste ups. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what paste ups are anymore. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, even when I'm like painting, I paint and then I scan it and then I totally retouch everything. You know? Right. And I often, if I have to do a you know, uh, background, I'll just put it in rather right. than work, working a bead for five hours over and over and over again to get a totally smooth background in watercolor. 
it takes, you know, half an hour. And yeah. that's, what God, that's why God that's why God invented perfectly. What? I said that's why God invented gouache. <laughs> No, I no, it's I mean, I think the thing is, is like, I think it, it's like, I mean, these are all tools, you know, to, to, to yeah. a brush and a pen and, you know, all the different tools we have available to make a final piece. But it is time consuming that gap between the one thing to the other, like it takes time to scan it and it takes time to import it, then export it or whatever you have to do. I also, I don't know how much, like, the the time that I do use on the board and how, how I scan things and all of that stuff, I don't know if I can necessarily take that time to learn to draw digitally, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It would take me about a month, probably, to really play around with all of the tools, play around with... It took me four years to find the brush I like using uh traditionally i don't know if i want to spend another you know month playing through a bunch of different pen dial like dialing in a pen um yeah i'd yeah. much rather be less precious about you know finding a, a good uh fountain pen and just figuring out like how that pen worked uh than i than i would be uh, I guess I guess it initially is the same thing, right? If I'm going to switch to a fountain pen, it's going to take me a month to figure out how to use that fountain pen correctly. Um, but or get the brush, line. The brush costs you fifteen to twenty bucks. New uh, software program and computer pad or whatever, use some teeth is going to cost you even used up to two thousand dollars. Yeah. So yeah. it's uh, you have to. Uh, you have to commit. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. Because, oh, well, this Cintiq doesn't work very well for me. Let me try the next one. Just yeah. slide it off to the side. I mean, that, yeah, and that's the thing. Like, anytime I've ever sort of bought into these things, like, they have either been, like, a firm necessity for work where, the, where they were going to pay for themselves, you know, right away and I'm going to make extra money off of it, or I have the luxury of being able to purchase it just to see what it does, you know? And that was like, you know, that's a one out of like four opportunity for me. So um, yeah, I, I, whatever, they're, 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 they're just tools, you know, I, I don't. It, they are tools, but the, mon the money commitment and the time and the learning curve to learn to draw on a computer is a little daunting to me, at least. And it sounds like it's daunting to Jamie too, am I right? Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, and I have tricks, right? Like there's things that I use that, you know, I talk to some of the, the kids, some of the, some of the, I call them kids. They're not that young, uh, yeah. <laughs> but younger artists. And we'll, we'll be talking about just my production and how, like, how am I able to draw five pages a day when they're still doing one page a day digitally and i'm and theoretically they should be able to go faster than me uh, but they're zooming in they're noodling and i'm drawing all of my penciled pages at size and then blowing that up to ink on right there's little things that i'm now very very keen on and i never have to erase and i can just kind of noodle around and i, I can see the whole page I get I zoom in too much when I'm digital. Whenever I play with somebody's iPad, I, yeah. I can't. I don't know. I think you can. I think you like. I think you can set how far you can zoom in, so that way you can't sort of become like you. You can't put detail that will never be seen. Like I sure. think. Well, I think you can figure that stuff out. I definitely do, and then I also take so much longer because I can undo. When oh. I when yeah. I don't have undo. I'm so much faster because I'm just thinking about what I need to draw <laughs> instead of trying to draw something well, it, think and then about I'm like, doing it and then figure it like read. I, I can actually draw faster because I'm, there's more thought process behind it. Because it's like, it's like chess. Like if you could play, if you played chess and you had an undo button to play chess, how long do you think a chess match would last? Oh yeah. It, it, forever. Right. <laughs> forever 
Yeah. I like I like speed drawing. Just <laughs> let me draw as fast as I possibly can. Right. Uh, I have I have often said that the, my least favorite part about making comics is drawing comics. Um, I love storyboarding. I love getting everything out on the page, but it takes so long. <laughs> so if well, I can speed up that process, I'm going to do it. Well, and Eric, I mean, like, yeah, and like, you know, to that point, that's what you said earlier, Eric. I mean, it doesn't pay, like, you're not making enough loot to hire someone to draw the thing for you. Like, you like, if you just love, like, I'm going to just come up with a story and I'm going to lay it out the way I want to, like, okay, now go, you artist, draw this thing and make it beautiful with this, you know, with your energy, your energy of youth and skill sets and off you go. Um, but you know, it does it, the, the economics of it don't bear out where you can just naturally kind of do that. My my dream, my dream job was Keith Giffen in the eighties, right, where he was just plotting out all of the superhero books. And the nineties, dude. That's I that he, he I worked with Keith. That's what I got. I it got was the, great. That was, was that's best. my dream job. Him and, and and more more so Harvey Kurtzman, but you know, as 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 I get better at writing comics. The, I I want to just write, draw the thumbnails, hand it to the artist, let the artist go ham, and then I can. Uh, Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. So, I, <laughs> would my, be great. My, yeah, I totally understand, but I think my ideal model is more like Dave Sim and Gerhardt, where uh, I don't do any of the backgrounds. Someone else does all my backgrounds. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to draw the characters. I want to draw the faces. I want to draw the hands. Right. I feel like that's that's a lot of where the story is, and the story is the most important part. And I want to make sure that communication gets across from me, not through someone else, through my layouts. Neil Gay, I, uh, Neil uh, Neil Adams would do that. He would he would like have everybody do all the sort of the the page work, and then he would draw in the faces and you know maybe the hands as well, which makes sense. Yeah, that's a dream job too. That's a, <laughs> and your name's on it. Yeah, great. <laughs> it's like, but it's it's like almost as interesting. Like what you're both describing is some sort of you know Western version and less organized version of manga. It's know? the it's production line. I think that uh, something the studio model of the '40s, like having the Eisner Iger Studio or something where you had people in charge, right? Mm -hmm you had the spirit and it was Will Eisner's spirit. And it was like, this guy's good at drawing backgrounds. This guy's good at drawing this, this guy's good. At, and just passing it through and then just being able to noodle on top and then publish that, right. I think is, is really great. That's also I mean, how like a lot of manga is done yeah. too, right? They have a guys who are good at drawing a certain things. The person who can draw cars really well, that guy does the cars. Yeah, right? yeah. Eric, you are you're you're phenomenal. Your line work is phenomenal. Like it's always been like exceptional when it came to your comes to your finished line work. But your 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 acting is really good as well. Like, do you think that's why you want to do the faces and hands? Me, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I feel like the entire body of any character is communicating mm -hmm. something about the story. You need to have. I uh, I need to be in control. <laughs> yeah, I need to. Be, I the, every line on the page is part. Even like some random thing in the background is part of the story. Communicates something, even if it's totally m m very minimal. Even yeah. if it's I don't know. I mean, I mean, you draw the side of a building, an outline of the side of a building. What does that communicate? I'm not. I'm not exactly sure how, what actually communicates. I don't know, but there's some sort of something. I think I I I am. I have a colorist named John Delaire. He is excellent because he takes direction. Um, we go through four or five sometimes up to eight iterations of a page. Mostly it's just me. Uh, he, he sends me a colored page and I look at it and I, I make notes. 
Mostly it's just me uh, saying change this color because he hasn't understood. Often he doesn't, when I've drawn lots of little tiny shapes, he hasn't quite understood what every shape is. So mm -hmm. like that, that's not an el that's an elbow, not part of the costume. Um, so just a lot of corrections like that. But every once in a while, I, sometimes I give him colors for characters' costumes, and sometimes I just say just I just tell him nothing, and he'll color the costumes, and then he'll come back to me. And sometimes it's like, oh, that's great, and sometimes I'm like, no, that's totally wrong. That character needs to look like this, not like that. Um, and I'll redesign the colors, coloring for the costumes. So I know that for me, I'm very, very controlling as far as what actually comes out under my name, even though his name is on the coloring. But the visual, what it, what it looks like is very important to me. And I want it to be a certain way, especially when there's a scene, a special scene that needs to have some sort of color progression or it's very important to communicate something about the story with the way that the the uh, scene is colored mm -hmm. um, for instance uh this is the latest this is this book will be out in december this is book three of age of bronze there's a sequence uh where menelaus is on the cloud and we're seeing the story from Menelaus's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, Helen is the most, as a young girl, is the most important character. So her colors are very strong, and everything around Helen, as it gets farther away, is much much lighter. It took us forever, John and me, to uh, come up to get that final final look. Is what I wanted. I was I was very concerned that in the printing some. The light stuff is going to disappear. Um, fortunately, this is a, a proof for this book, and uh, it's, it appears as I, as I wanted it. Well, this explains yeah. to me that, a lot of back, a lot of back and forth about what I want. So I know that even if I hired someone, like draw my backgrounds, mm -hmm. I'd still be like, "Oh, that needs to be like this. This needs to be like this." And I'd be like, "Why am I hiring somebody?" Sure. Why am I not just doing myself? Because it takes so much of my own concentration and time to manage the people who I'd be hiring. To yeah. Do that. So well, I don't. Yeah, this explains to me why you only let you only let me color one thing of yours ever. So that uh, that, that answers that. That answers the great mystery of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, so, so, but this actually dovetails into, into the subject of having your own imprint, because having your own imprint is a key externality of wanting more control in the thing that you do um, and gaining agency in whatever fashion you can. So, like, for, you know, Jamie, you said your moment was, you know, at the show and following a sort of a frank discussion with, someone in, you know, in, in you know, on the editorial side, like Eric, what, like, was there a point for you when you said, like, I need to have my own imprint into my own thing? Well, I mean, it's not, there's sort of points. Uh, I, I came up with the idea for Age of Bronze in 91, and uh, I just decided I was going to publish it myself. Okay. That was the idea. Uh, my partner, David, wanted to take over this fiction sort of fan fiction magazine that was published by the International Wizard of Oz Club and he was getting pushed back and I said why do you even want to take over their magazine uh why don't you just start your let's start our own mm -hmm. and so we had this project and I had Age of Bronze and we just said okay let's do our own publishing company so then uh we started doing his project in 95 and that was I I had been working on Age of Bronze, a lot of research, a lot of writing, uh, deciding what it was going to be. Um, I hadn't actually started drawing anything, any pages yet. Uh, then 
I got this news. I was calling up distributors and I called Heroes World and they're like, oh, we're not distributing anything else from anybody. Marvel just bought us. And I'm like, what? <laughs> And so suddenly the whole distribution of comics just changed overnight in ni about 1995. And uh, I'm like, oh, I cannot self-publish this book because I will never get it distributed. Right. And that's when I'm like, oh, I have to find a publisher for Age of Bronze. And I started looking around and finally found an Im image. That was, well, that's not about my own imprint. That's about someone else's own imprint. Uh, I had known Eric Larson for a while and I saw him at, a, at WonderCon one year and he goes, what, you're, what are you working on? I said, well, I'm shopping around this project about the Trojan War. Here's, I had an, I had printed some ash cans of the first issue and, and he goes, oh, let me see. And I'm like, yeah, here you go. I was just showing it to him because, you know, fellow cartoonist. Took some you work. And he goes, and he's like, oh, I'll publish this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> he goes, yeah, I'll give you the standard deal that Image, image is giving. Uh, I'm like, Image Comics published this. And uh, so I went home and I'm like, I don't know whether this is a good idea or not. Because it's like, not like, it's not about big guns or big tits. Right. Like in, in 95, 96, 90, I think it's about 90, 1997. He's like, that's how the image publishes. They were publishing some stuff, uh, but that was not their, what do you know, was their go to. The, uh, the uh, idea that most people had of what image yeah. not uh, these black and white self self uh, self generated creative. Well, everything was self generated, but you know. But then it turned out. So I called up people who who were being published by Image who were doing these other other types of things, Colleen Duran and and uh, oh goodness, the Kabuki guy, David Mack. David, yeah. And uh, and and talked with them, and so then I just it's like okay, Image. But uh, David, David and I are had David and I continued publishing books and all kinds of things. Um, he started publishing CDs. I actually withdrew with withdrew from. Publishing company that we started in the 90s in about 2002, 2003, and have not been at least legally uh, attached to that for a while, although I still do artwork for him. And every project he does, he's like, What do you think of this? And I like do a lot of proofreading and stuff. But now I'm doing this book, this, the making of a TikTok man of Oz. So we're going to publish that through the Hungry Tiger. Hungry Press. Tiger, yeah. yeah. Which we started in the nineties. So, I mean, like, what were the big, like, what are you, like, what do you think are the biggest, like, hurdles when you're when you're running your own imprint? Uh, well, make sure that you get all your legal stuff in order. Like, you need a business license from the city, from your county, from your state, whatever. You have to uh, get a federal ID number. Uh, make sure you know whether you're a self self uh, proprietor a sole proprietor or partnership uh and you might have to get stuff notarized so but make sure if you're going to start your own publishing company you get all that in order you're going to have to do taxes for the company uh make sure you understand that uh make sure you understand registering copyright because mm -hmm. i mean and you're going to have to write con if you're going to be hiring other people to do anything, you're gonna have to write contracts, negotiate contracts with them. Uh, make sure uh, you pay them a fair wage, or at least fair wage within your means. Uh, be fair with people. I think the comics industry has, is notorious for yeah. grabbing all rights. Uh, I think the fairest. If you're if you're like you really small, you can't pay people a lot. You know, but pay them as much as you can. That's that seems relatively fair for us on a small scale. You know, offer them free copies, but I would like within you know give free copies out, but always try to pay something. Yeah, and 
take as few writes. If you're not going to be paying very much, take as few writes as possible. Just the first, first publication writes, if, if that works for you. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're not sexy, but they're 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 important. They're all very important because yeah. it's the kind of thing like because it's it's not just like cool. I made a comic book. I'm a comic book publisher. Like there there's especially the second you involve another another human being, it becomes it becomes a much bigger thing. And then you know, as we were talking, you know, like maybe this goes to Broadway. Joking, um, but like the idea that like this could be in a different media it the, those legal things need to be locked down because you don't want to get taken for you know the farm yeah you don't you're not paying taxes and keep it off right <laughs> you're not gonna be happy anyway you're gonna be very visible if, you yeah. if your paperwork signed over so I got I got this book. I don't know if you've seen either of you have seen this book. Yeah, I, I've only seen it on like Facebook ads or something. Okay. Yeah. So Gamal Hennessy, who is the um, he's a lawyer who does a lot of work for Marvel and DC. So he does a lot of their sort of like um, IP law put together. I mean, this is not a small book. Like it's a legitimate like tome. About all the ins and outs in necessary necess, necessary. I'll put it in the, link in the doobly doo. Um, it's definitely worth checking out because if you have a question about something, you just go into the index and you find the page and yeah, follow the steps. Yeah, there's a there's a publisher in I think from San Francisco, Nolo Press and Olo. They publish a lot of legal guides on. Copyright, trademark, publishing, stuff like that. They are a very good resource too. And they're I would I would I don't I don't know that book that you just showed, Alex, but yeah. uh, I would say get that book uh, and books like it on publishing, the business of publishing, especially specifically self-publishing. There are a bunch there are a bunch of resources out there. I'll get the I'll get the I'll get the links from you about the about the, about those that you were talking about so we can just put them in there to make it a resource for people because I think it's it, it's it's daunting if you have it all up in here and you can't like see that little simple roadmap of what it, what it takes to do these things versus so much of it too is just like go knowing where to start and you can be an expert at Google searching stuff but just hacking through the mire of of youtube videos and sure you know it's it's and i'm i'm pretty much all internet taught on on that side of stuff but it's you know i've watched a bunch of videos that told me nothing right. it's just like i'm gonna hoping hoping that there's some kind of gold some nugget of knowledge that and, and sometimes i'll watch like hour and a half long videos and I'll get one good thing, yeah. one good book recommendation. It's like, well, write that down and go read that book. But it's, it's hard. And it's easier and easier to just like get funding for something through crowdfunding campaigns. Yeah. Now too. So it's like, it's easier and easier to do self-publishing and become a small business without any of the the yeah. knowledge on how to actually do something and without uh, actually being a business right <laughs> right for sure it's, for sure. it's crazy so um, that 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 ties it that that sort of kind of fits in with what you're going through at the moment jamie so jamie's jamie's in his fourth baboon or is this the third baboon this is the fourth i think baboon crowdfunding campaign yeah right but you've abandoned kickstarter not that i saying abandoning Kickstarter, but you you are not doing this one on Kickstarter, but you're on Crowdfunder. Yeah. And we, you know, we've talked and the experience is of much, much of an uphill climb that much more of an uphill climb than you intended it to be. Yeah. <laughs> Switching from puffs to Kleenex has been, has been very tricky. Yeah. As much as, as, much as I like puffs. Um, yeah. I think Crowdfunder is a better site definitely for crowdfunding uh comics you know the, you're you're able to like change verbiage and stuff like that but you know switching 
switching when you've done i've done seven successful kickstarters uh and then switching over to doing something that is uh not that that is not as well known but is starting to be like they were a sponsor for spx this past year and a lot of small uh press cartoonists that i've spoken to are like we can't wait to do something with crowdfunder uh, because they they as a company are very like we're a small business we're going to help a small business and a small mm -hmm. publisher do something whereas kickstarter is a lot of just five hundred dollar kickstarters to nine thousand dollar kickstarters aren't really making a drop in the bucket um and it's just it's very bloated um but they're they they treat a lot of the the back end stuff the the creator side of it much more uh, as a community so like we you have you can connect with people you can connect with other creators easier through that through their site rather than just looking on twitter scrolling through twitter seeing who has a kickstarter going on right now well what do you what do you feel that i mean what's the benefit for that for you as the person who's crowdfunding uh because i'm not doing so because it's just me mm -hmm. right uh you you hope to have a group of people that are going to help promote stuff um and i'm i'm i feel very fortunate that i do have a bunch of cartoonists and, and creators that are uh they may be running kickstarters right now but they're like hey go check out crowdfunder <laughs> yeah. there's another site and then there are other cartoonists over there um but it's really just pulling pulling focus to a different a different site being able to have uh, a site that is willing to promote you is is great. I think you know, like Crowdfunder will retweet stuff that I do. Uh, yeah. Crowdfunder will also uh, make posts about my campaign, which is nice. You know, it, it kind of takes the burden off a little bit from just being the only person. Uh, that that's why I think anthology projects are so popular on Kickstarter and crowdfunding because you have, you're pulling a bunch of different people together and then combining audiences. Um, but when you do it by yourself, just as a single cartoonist, and if you don't have a, a, an insane following to just pull your audience uh, to wherever you're going to go, having some kind of, uh, backing and I guess moral support from from the site that you're using is a huge it's a huge weight off your shoulders just you're not in it alone you're not on 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 the boat by yourself I guess it's kind of I mean that's that's sort of like if you're work if you're working with a publisher you know like let's say oh. image is an example like if they're like hey we're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna put you in the solicits we're, we're gonna do a couple house ads you know for the book like these are the kinds of things that you feel like okay cool like i'm not just putting my comic out there and then it's just landing in a store and no one will find it like it's it's super important to basically get your message out there um is right. that like, like eric do you feel like, like that's something that's been a struggle for you like getting your the awareness of your pro your projects your books out there days uh, when back in the 90s when I was part of this new in this new publishing company and also a little later when I age of bronze started I was very into like figuring out how to do publicity well my idea was well I've got to let people know that this product exists and the more people I know, the higher the percentage of people who buy it will be. Uh, so I just, it was just getting it out, figuring out how publicity worked and doing it. And it was a little bit fun because it was a challenge to do it well and then see it pay off. Uh, as time has passed, it, I've gotten far less interested in that mm. aspect. It seems more like a burden. It's not my favorite thing to do. Um, learning a skill and then acquiring the skill and then being able to say okay now i know how to do this is kind of fun 
but then once you've acquired it and have to do it again, and it doesn't change that much from project to project, is kind of kind of tedious if it's yeah. not something I'm particularly interested in. So I find, and as I get as I age, <laughs> slowly find myself less and less interested in spending time and energy on stuff that I'm not interested in. So doing publicity is hard, harder and harder just because I have so little interest in it at this point. Um, now, I haven't done a whole lot of publicity for anything, but you know, I do little things every, every, every project I do, but doing a huge publicity push I haven't done in a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So the whole world has changed since then in the last 10 years. So it is gonna be discovering new ways and new skills. So maybe it'll be a little more exciting uh, do to do it from now on. Yeah, do you know Jazlyn Stone? She's, she's, in the Port she's in the Portland area. So she's a she's a um, yeah she's a freelance um, marketing consultant for comics. I'll, I'll send you I'll I'll connect the two of you if you want if you want I'll give you so you can talk to her. Um, sure. She's great and she's like totally like she seems to be really kind of like on it when it comes to like getting you know the word out on on these um, books and projects that otherwise may not be seen and she's and she's a totally cool person so um you may just dig her as a, an individual to begin with. sure yeah um okay. but it's like but it, i mean but it, there's so many more factors like the idea of like consulting with a, a you know a marketing person you know consulting with a social media expert who can you know figure out the right way to pulse out your message you know over whatever platforms and you know, Jamie, you're kind of doing all of these things independently, um, you know, on Twitch and Twitter, and Instagram, and yeah, Semaphore. I I have done more promoting for this book than I've ever done in the past, um, <laughs> like significantly more. And I had a plan going in. I had all of this stuff like prepared and ready and posts to make and pre-done everything was ready everything was set and it's still like a drop in the bucket uh it's it's interesting pulling people over from one site to another site that's really i i hope it's not just people aren't un, are uninterested in what i'm doing anymore but yeah. it's been uh it has definitely been harder to grab the audience uh and it doesn't help like three weeks ago uh uh, there there was a massive change in like the Instagram algorithm, right? So right before I started, Instagram changed. Uh, this week, Elon Musk bought Twitter. So like a bunch of people are just leaving Twitter, right? right? right. Un unforeseen things. Uh, and then certain, you know, comics is always, it seems like comics is always imploding. Um, so it's like, I launched the crowdfunder and then the... Twitter that day was talking about some person being canceled and like that becomes the main comic book news. Right. Yeah. So it's always just some, some major thing happening that you're competing against. And I hate that. It's like, it feels like competition in a lot of ways where it's, well, I'm trying to get eyes on this and now gosh, Leslie Jordan died and I got to compete with Leslie Jordan dying. Like you can't, you just can't do that. Right. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a huge challenge to try to cut the, cause it's an amazing tool. Like here's this amazing tool that allows us to communicate with anybody in the world from anywhere we want, which is really quite fantastic. The downside is, is that everybody's trying to communicate with everybody at the same moment. Right. And, we we you know it, and like your idea of going from one place to another it would be like you have your local comic book store but then you show up on wednesday and they're not there they've moved to a different location yeah and it might be a little note in the window saying hey here's our new address but like it's it's very hard to get people to go like oh wait i gotta i've got to figure out a whole new route to go over to the comic book store 
and then they'll, they'll second guess all their reasons for doing the comic books or whatever the thing is. Right. So it becomes this huge kind of like thing. So for, for you to like, you know, everyone's got these grooves in their life sending them the places that they go. And this case is like, everyone goes over to Kickstarter because Kickstarter is the place that you go for this stuff. Yeah. You know, I was just, just talking to, funny enough, I was just talking to somebody at the comic shop about crowdfunder. I was like, he was like, yeah, I was, I planned on like buying your book. And he was like, and he, he, and he was like, and I did it this morning. I didn't do it right when it launched because I had to fill in my credit card information. I was right. like, yeah, because on Kickstarter, it's already preloaded. Like it's already there. So you can just yeah. hit back and then it's, it's automatic. Whole new, yeah, it's a whole new, it's like a whole new thing. And the, any bear, like, it's like the website, my, 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 le, my design philosophy for website is if you have to click more than two things, people, you're losing people. Like people right. just don't want to, like, I don't know, I got to click a third thing. Like they don't want to do it. Right. Um, so yeah and so yeah eric you're you're like the next thing that you have to promote like it there's an interesting like learning curve yeah yeah are you i mean would you consider doing a crowdfunded book like is that something that you would like yeah yeah oh. yeah it's a full-time job we'll just say it's a it's a month yes. full-time job I yes. haven't drawn, <laughs> really. I did a 10-page comic this month, which uh, was just for Inktober stuff. Yeah. I did a third of a page a day. And that's about all the drawing I did this month. And I was still like super, super behind on it and just spent the last couple of days drawing six pages. But in just catching up, just to have something to show that I did, I did work. Right. Wait, you, Jamie, have you said what this crowdfunder project is? No. I there don't you know. go. Have I? The, Jamie, the master of marketing here. Um, <laughs> what, what's the actual name of the of the project you you have available on crowdfunder? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it is uh, the baboon, the temple of eternal life. It's the second uh, hardcover baboon book. It's ninety four pages, full color. It's real. It's real. It's real crispy. It's a really nice looking book. Um, it is. It's gonna. It's gonna look like the first book, but it's a really nice, like Tell me the presentation. Hook. Yeah, what's the, the hook? hook? The hook. What's the hook? The uh, the well, the baboon is my love letter to pulp '40s and '50s comics. So things like uh, it's uh, Johnny Quest, the Spirit, uh, Indiana Jones kind of feel. Uh, it is. Terry and the Pirates. Yeah. So it's just, it's my love letter to that. So everything is, they're one and done stories that uh, follow the baboon and his sidekick, Jamie, on these epic adventures. Uh, this one takes place in the jungles of South America, and they're looking for the gem of eternal life. And that's very, very just like one and done pulp stories. It's my, it's, it's fun. I've read the first 20, 20, 25 pages. Yeah. 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 It's fun. It's good. I, I, I dig your coloring. It's got, it's got a, it's got a bit of that, um, that touch that uh, Jacob Phillips is doing on the criminal, like the criminal books and all that kind of stuff. It's got that really cool, yeah, yeah. like just kind of tonal painterly kind of thing happening below black and white artwork. It's kind of cool. Yeah. It's really limiting color palettes yeah. to, do some of that stuff yeah yeah it's also an all ages book that's the i guess that's the other thing it is it is a book made for uh adults and kids it yeah. doesn't well, and not i, I mean, try not to pander towards like uh you know i'm not writing fart jokes mm. and i'm not making like sexual innuendos uh, mm. I'm, I'm trying to like write a book that is entertaining for both audiences yeah yeah uh, yeah. That's what I'll ask. Maybe maybe you can send Eric your your preview of that. So yeah, can, I will. That'd be good. Um, yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's a huge challenge. Uh, having done one sort of comic book Kickstarter, and I've done a few for other projects, but it is it's a it's a full time gig, and there is you know there's this sort of like sea of unknownness that happens between the first week and the last week, and you just kind of have to 
paddle your way through and pr pray that like everything works out the way it normally works out where yeah. everybody wakes up and does their homework at the last minute and, and gets on board. It is, it is cool. You can see on crowdfunder and, and, and Kickstarter has a similar function, but, uh, you can see how many people have liked the project and not backed the project <laughs> yet. And uh, I'm sitting on like 50 people liking it and not backing it. I'm like, well, just, uh, you know, just throw some, throw some ducats and, some <laughs> and, and then it'll be funded. Yeah. Um, well, that's it. And hopefully that's usually what happens is people do that. It just takes some time to kind of, you know, enter their credit card. Info. Yeah. This is also the first time I have done stuff outside of the platform for promoting as well. Uh, talking about promotion, I'm doing a, uh, a panel at the local bookstore in town and they're taking pre-orders for the book and selling the first book uh, during the panel. So it's like building interests to people who are actually going to bookstores and buying comics. Right. Um, in other, other than just doing that at comic shops, which I've done in the past, this is branching into the market outside of just your typical comic book. This is, this is mass market and not, not the direct market anymore, which is interesting. I just, I fell into a having a relationship with, uh, the owner of this bookstore and her husband. And we're just like, they're like, Oh, they like inviting me to go to dinner with them and having have it. We're friends now. And I watch their dogs every now and then. So it's like, Oh, I've fallen into this, uh, promotional engine <laughs> through, uh, a, with an actual bookstore. Um, and like the comic shop's very supportive and I run a drink and draw event it, uh, in town. So it's like multiple outlets that aren't just on the internet. Um, yeah. So. It's diversification. Diversification is strength. Yeah. Yeah, it's for sure. For sure. And your, your books, you're, you've been in mass, more mass sort of stores, right, Eric, with your, with the, the Oz books and with, uh, Oh yeah. 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 I mean, uh, I mean, well, I've had all different kinds of experiences coming on different publishers and things, different projects. Uh, I mean, I was, I wrote some adaptations of Oz books for Marvel and they got, they were very, very popular and yeah. got on the New York Times graphic novels bestseller list. And then, you know, I could go down to the local Barnes and Noble or whatever it was, Borders or whatever it was, it was the end. There was, they were on the shelves there uh, available for sale, face out, you know, <laughs> which was a terrific experience, but it doesn't, that does not happen yeah. very often. Um, with, uh, with Age of Bronze, I, I knew there was a possible potential entire market outside comics within the classics uh, field and archaeology field. Uh, so, and the um, the Trojan War, which is what Age of Bronze is, uh, is a literary long literary tradition. So I knew I had that sort of. Uh, possible audience yeah. to draw on. So I definitely tried to tap tap into things like that. Uh, I joined the Historical Novel Society specifically to be able to have Age of Bonds reviewed in their in their uh, magazine. Uh, just looking for alternate avenues outside comics because Comics is, is great, and I'm happy for whatever support I get there. But I've never been, except for that, except for that Marvel, the Marvel uh, Oz, stuff, Oz yeah. project. I've never been, you know, like top popularity. Never been on top popularity list. So it's just trying. To, my my philosophy is: the more people that know about it, the higher the percentage of those people will be who actually buy it. So I just gotta make sure people know. And then if 1% of the people who have ever heard of it buy it, that'll be great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. It's, it's, it's becoming more and more, uh, I had a discussion with a friend of mine about 
Twitter and forums and uh, was talking, we were talking about if, if there's a mass exodus on Twitter, how are we going to promote our indie comics? And uh, he said, he was like, go, I, I will go right back to forums and I will probably sell more comics than I ever have when I was just, you know, when you're yelling into a vacuum, it, which is what often social media feels like there is no, uh, you're, you're, it's really hard to find your niche of audience, but yeah. if you're going through historical magazines, everybody that's picking up that historical magazine is interested in, in history yeah. in some point. So it's, for me, it's like finding the old, the people who loved old Hanna-Barbera cartoons and going and targeting that as my audience right. and uh, people well, who like pulp stuff. Part of your audience, one segment of your audience. Right. right. Sure. All those niche groups. Yeah. Yes. There's, there's also the people who love old com, you know, adventure comic strips. And there's the people who love Will Eisner and there's the people who love, and you just keep making, you have all these different groups as Eric's saying. So right. like, you know, to Eric's like historical, you know, you know, joining that society, like, is there a, you know, pulp comics, like official society out there for people who are like, you know, and then you right. Join that, and then they review your comic, and then then your comic book becomes something that they're looking at because there's only so many versions of the same thing that they've already read, reprinted that they, you know, that's new to them. But like, if right. you say, "Hey, here's something new in this vein," they're gonna go, "Oh, well, I already like this. Uh, I'll right, take it." Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting. It, this kind of stuff is fascinating. And this is like what you were saying, Eric, is like, you know, back when you're doing promotion, you get you get woven into the idea of like, how do I get this 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 information out there, you know, and, and clever, creative ways of doing it. So now, you know, that's what this is, is how do we how do you take the product that you're making, figure out what these audiences are and then go chase each one of these audiences with sort of the same information you're just positioning it for a different sort of flavor you know palette oh you like spicy food well this is spicy oh you like your food hot well this is hot and spicy oh you like your food with you know with meat in it well it has meat and it's spicy and it has heat you know and you just keep hitting all these people you know that's why doritos are so good um <laughs> speaking of doritos is they're spicy hot and have meat no, there's no meat in Doritos. I don't, I don't eat meat, so I can't talk. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, although I did find my friend of mine posted something. He was holding a bag of, this may not have any, any weight to you, Jamie, but um, the taco flavored Doritos from the 70s, like the original Dorito that we saw when we were kids in the 70s, they're making them again. They have them in the original packaging like it's this weird throwback to being you know 10 years old again and uh, so i bought it I, I i had permission to buy them so i bought them and uh and we both ate them and we're like this is like time travel it was really weird so if you like old food is it in the retro it, did, did they do like the retro packaging too oh, no, it's, it's the same exact packaging from the 70s that's amazing yeah they were at target so maybe if you go to target you can find them Nostalgia market. It's well. Look, what what do you what do you think all the what do you think of all the Star Wars stuff on Disney Plus? That's the nostalgia market. They're making they're making billion dollars on nostalgia, and uh, and so are you. You're you know you're you're playing to the the classics, Eric. I'm making a billion dollars. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Go buy your lottery ticket tonight so you can win the billion dollars. And then you can then you can just sit back and you can just tell your colorist to change all the layers you want. <laughs> yeah. That's a plan. It's a business Thanks, plan. Alex. Thanks, yeah. Alex. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Um, so what's so what's what's lined, Eric? What's lined up for you, man? What's what's coming down the road? See, so you're getting you're going to get the you're going to get the. Tick, I'm going to say it right, the TikTok man? Oh, the TikTok man of Oz. As soon as I get this book done, it's coming out. I got to do a little bit of a promotion for it. When, God, when does it come out? When? I will. 
Well, May I recommend uh, TikTok? I'm gonna oh. say January. I'm gonna say January 2023. TikTok. You got to get a TikTok account for the TikTok man. Oh, that is a great idea. That's Jamie's. I just said it better. <laughs> Step aside, Jaslyn. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. No, no, that is perfect. That is absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. How are you at dancing? Me? I got to go to. Uh, I got to go to class later tonight. Sweet, because TikTok's all about dancing, right, Jamie? So I, I don't know. I, I, I don't understand TikTok at all. Yeah, but um, it is, the, it is the perfect, it is the perfect platform for what you're, you know, the name of your thing. So. Yeah, but I got to edit videos, right? Ugh, I don't know. I don't know anything about talk. TikTok. You could just talk. flip the phone on and be like, "TikTok man, tag." There's, I'm sure there's like a whole Wizard of Oz. Yeah, side there's of TikTok. There's gotta be. There's gotta be. Uh, but I have, to show, I have to show images. I have to show. I have to be really good. Uh, that's awesome. that's because it's you. You've got nice to make. It. Yeah. But okay, so that comes out. I mean, the Age of Bronze book three comes out in December. Color. Yes. Yeah, color version of it. Yes. December 2022. Comics wherever graphic novels are sold. Nice. And then TikTok Man, the beginning of the year of 23. Jamie's going to be on a yacht because he made so much money on Crowdfunder for the Baboon Book Three, The Temple of Eternal Life. Did I get that right? Yeah. Whew. So what what so Eric, what do you what do you are you going to be drawing? I mean, do you have a script in mind for something you want to do? Or what's the what's no, I have I have been really slow on Age of Bronze for the past too many years. So as I as soon as Chuck Man of Oz is done, I have a few small projects that I have to get done as fast as possible, and then I'm back on Age of Bronze for the foreseeable future. Okay. Uh, I hope until I'm finished with the project. Right on. So that you think how many more like how many more books do you foresee? I really don't know because I am. Um, changing my vision of how these are going to be issued oh. um, because it it's right now too long between volumes and so i'm going to have to be rethinking actual publication uh format so okay. i don't know but there are seven parts we're in part three right now gotcha so there are ostensibly four more parts to go yeah all right I, I want to see I it. Know how, I don't know how many books that's going to be. Yeah, I, I want to see it. I mean, like your, I mean, you know, whatever. Your artwork is amazing, dude. Like you are just Thank one you. of the best draftsmen in the business. Thank you. I keep trying. I keep doing my best. I'm just the thing. You know, the thing is making the communication, making the faces, making the body language, making all those hands communicate. All the nuances that everything that the reader has to understand. It's all about yeah. communication. Communication and clarity. Even if I'm trying to do something really obscure, it has to be clear that yeah. I'm that obscure. Communication and clarity. That is what storytelling, any form of storytelling is about, at least in my philosophy. That's my philosophy. Yeah. Well, I think I think I think, you know, as a creator, whatever the thing that you're making, you have to have that sort of that foundational like you know, philosophy yeah. or values or whatever the things are. That, like these are the things that I fit my my viewing port. You know, is my lenses. What are yours, Jamie? What are my lungs? My uh, your lenses. What is your lens? Oh, my lenses. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, I I am a production guy. I think just by the nature of what I'm trying to do. You know, writing pulp fiction stuff, I think, is a lot of just writing as fast as you can, putting it out as quick as I can, and mm -hmm. then moving on to the next thing. Like, if I mess up, I, I just move on. Um, should I probably spend more time on it? Yes. <laughs> do, I, do I like the idea of just having a shelf of books that kind of feel imperfect, but yet 
fun to pick up. Like Doc Savage isn't perfect. Not, like reading those books is uh, is tricky sometimes. But like I have a shelf of spirit uh, reprints, and it's twenty seven volumes of the spirit. Right. That's it was just production, and some are better than the others, and you know. Uh, and I, I think at this point in my career and my life, I am just, I'm, I'm good with, a, a just a chunk of, a chunk of shelf, and going as fast as I can. Yeah, I'm becoming more and more interested in, uh, my own viewpoint, on on certain things. So adding that to the character, which I know like most writers are like, Oh, this is, I'm going to write about how I feel about a subject, but I was never like that. Yeah. Um, but more and more the characters and kind of stories that I uh, tell are becoming more and more kind of a, a, a surrogate for how I'm dealing with life, things, relationships, all, all of that. It's, it's you're becoming, trying say, you're, so you're trying to say something with your, your art. More and more. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. Well, it can. I mean, listen. It doesn't have to be sort of you know slapped in your face. You can do it with with technique and make it pretty. You know, it doesn't have to be. Right. Yeah. 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 This the the book that is funding now is is a lot about uh, how uh, stories and and the way that. Uh, families tell stories and keeping, keeping the spirit of, of family alive through the stories that they tell and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's much more found family as a big theme in a lot of my books that I didn't realize when I started writing it, mm -hmm. you know, and now it's like, it took an editor to go, your book's about found family. And I went, Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks for telling me. Isn't, but that's like, I mean, I think that's a, I, I mean, listen, I think if you have an ensemble, you know, when you're writing a piece of work, uh, unless it is about a family, you know, it, they typically are found family. I mean, like Wizard of Oz is found family. Uh, you know, like all these stories that we, you know, my book is about found family. Uh, the, the characters all have families. They all have independent lives. But this one, the, the what we are seeing, this framework is a found family. And I think that's kind of an interesting, you know, because everyone approaches those in a very different way. Yeah. That's, that's very true. Yeah. Um, the idea of reaching perfection or letting something go out imperfect is sort of not even a question because everything's going to be imperfect. Once you put it down, <laughs> It's imperfect. Yeah. 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 So trying to, waiting until something is perfect until you can draw the perfect line or write the perfect sentence is pointless because you never will. So if you'd rather see a chunk of your work on the shelf and have it perfect, that's probably the best way to go. <laughs> yeah. I think so. I certainly, I certainly have uh, perfectionist tendencies. Probably you can tell that by the way I draw. Never but uh, the uh, I is certainly you know I you have to turn it in so you have to get it done at some point and I have to say it's done at some point um, and it is never perfect but the idea of putting yourself putting oneself into one work in one's work that's sort of inescapable because your work is going to be anyone's work is going to be them no matter what. You can't get away from that. My challenge is figuring out what I'm actually trying to say with the work I do, because I have ideas and I have enthusiasm for to, to do projects, but I don't know what they're about. I don't know why, why or what they're about, you know, on the deeper level, whatever right. that means, what part of me is really in there. Uh, and sort of, I don't care because most of my ideas are just, you know, fit into some genre and genre fiction is just not known for like the deeper literary themes. Mm -hmm. But I find that 
the work that I most enjoy, the type of story I most enjoy consuming is genre that has something, some substance to it, something behind yeah. it, some, some real a chunk of life or something where you really have to confront problems. I, mean, I guess probably like one of my favorite books is The Oxbow Incident, which is a Western. I mean, that's what it is on the surface. But it's you read that book and it's like philosophy of life. And how do you deal with, you know, deciding who's going to live or die? Um, so that's why I like it. So, yeah, I would love to produce produce work like that. But I feel like I'm far too shallow a person to be able to deal with stuff like that. So I'm always like trying to figure out what am I trying to say with this project that I'm working on? What are the deeper themes that are, are actually part of me that I'm trying to put out for the world to say something? And I'm like, I don't even know. Anyway, so I, I have these ideas about what Age of Bronze is about and what I'd really like to do with it. That's yeah. what I'm trying to say. But, you know, then I get caught up in what the story that I'm, you know, the, I have to like make these characters do this certain Each thing. I have to have them say these certain things in this scene to get to this point. How do I make that clear? How do I make the communicate to the reader what's going on on the surface? Because that's the story. And then like whatever's underneath the surface, just how do I, I just for the most part, I'm just like that just has to come along. It's. But I, you know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I, you know, it's so interesting because like, what I'm thinking about when you're saying that I'm listening to you is that, you know, remember you remember English class in like in like sophomore year and the teachers up there telling you what this book means. Like, here's what this book means. And I would, I did exactly what you would do. I'd roll my eyes and I would go, well, how do you know what the book means? Like, did the author write this down and say this is what it means? And I often believe that, like, well authors can you can tease out the themes in your book but i think you write the book that you write and then you can go back and you go you know what i really need to e express this with the character throughout these elements of the story to really kind of drive whatever point home but in the end you are servicing this story and you're servicing the characters to achieve the story that you've laid out but it becomes the responsibility of the of the reader to be the person who deci decides what the themes are in your book, because they're the ones who are reading and experiencing it. And whatever they pull out and parse from it, that's what the theme is to them. I don't know. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, that is true. But uh, what I'm, yeah. And I don't care what you what my work means to you. On on one level, it's like okay, if that's what you got from this reading this story that I wrote, if you got something totally different than what I was actually trying to express, cool. That's your deal. That if that means something to you, that's great. But yeah, I I, I don't it. know. I don't know. Yeah, but so like with Age of Bronze. My statement on what 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 is God is a very important part of this story. What or what not what God is what is God and what isn't God? Right. Like is no there is no God is basically one of my major themes. Um, and we create all our own troubles and are responsible for our own troubles and joys. Um, so I feel like that's built into this story, which I was given this story structure because I'm retelling an old legend. Yeah. So I have to like, it's like this, all these threads in this long, in this, in this tapestry. So I have to like, which threads do I emphasize? Mm -hmm. to yeah. make no, I mean, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's a challenge. But like, you know, like when I was in junior high, a junior in high school and the teacher's we're reading The Great Gatsby and the teacher's saying, well, yellow is a very significant color in this book. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what is the yellow is not no, I don't believe you. Yeah, sure. So I still don't believe I still don't believe it. yellow is a significant color for what? Yeah. No, no. 
Anyway, so if I get like F. Scott Fitzgerald scholars emailing me telling me I'm totally wrong in my <laughs> dismissal of the color yellow in the Great Gatsby, great, but whatever. Well, I guess we could, we could only hope to have people arguing over the meaning of the things that we do. Oh, I, I did this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. You argue over. Yeah. I love yeah. you. Because <laughs> yeah, you actually read my book, even if you hated it. Right. it. <laughs> hey, listen, hate is a, as valuable as love. You know what I mean? Like it made you feel something. And that's important. I'll take that. I'll take I'll take some sort of passion. I did this project in the 90s called The Elsewhere Prince. I drew it. I didn't write it. But I, and I didn't, I, oh, I had a very difficult relationship with the material. Um, it was a spinoff of Mobius's Airtight Garage. And uh, I didn't have an in for myself to the material. Mm. I didn't, I didn't naturally take them to the material. And I was like, what is this about? What do I have to bring to it? Um, and I, I actually, I have never, I never actually quite figured it out. Talking, the Jean-Marc and Randy Lefissier were the scripters, and uh, Mobius was slightly attached to the project, so I had some limited uh, contact with him. But I was, I never, I never had a real connection with that project. I tried my best. I did the best I could. One of the things I did was, though, take the colors. I like assigned each major character a color and uh, tried to uh, use those colors within the story to tell part of the story. I wasn't the colorist, but I assigned okay. all the colors to the colorist. Um, and it sort of worked. But then uh, there was this epic marvel epic published in the u.s but there were they had a reciprocal contract with uh the with the french french publisher who did not like to, to do bleeds and part of my color design was that every color every page was a bleed with the color bleeding off on, on all the margins yeah and they didn't want to do that oh, so no. they chopped them down so they were just frames i didn't think it worked ouch anyway. Oh, I don't know. I was a, it was, I, there, there were so many, there were good things about that project, but trying to get a personal connection with the story was very difficult for me. Yeah. Well, I've that, left projects for that reason or, or, you know, start talking to people and start uh, developing things and then realizing that our, our either visions are not aligned. And I, I feel fortunate enough that I can go off and write my own thing and, and still put out a book. Um, but man, that is, that is the thing trying to find some kind of connection to the, to the material has become more and more important to me, especially now, like trying now that I've written so much for my own, for myself, if I'm going to collaborate with someone, it's gotta be like, what, why am I doing this? What's the, what's the reason? Yeah, I think it's, gotten, that, I mean, it's gotten easier for me. I, the time I took that project, it was the late '80s, and I was less than I've been a professional cartoonist for less than ten years, and I wasn't practiced in the idea of this is an actual step I have to go through if I haven't generated the project, where I have to figure out what my connection to the project is. Yeah, um, I I was able to go through that, you know, make that a conscious uh, step in my creative process later, I had to figure that out on my own. It's like, what about this project that some editors called me up and I've accepted? What about this project that I have no personal connection to is going to be my personal connection to this project? Yeah. I have to, I have to, at this point, make those things, make that happen or else it's, it's not, it, yeah. it's not I, anything. I, 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 not yeah. anything. It's not, I can't do it. it. Turns out not good. I think I think I have the same uh, thought, especially with work like superhero work or mainstream work, where I, I people will say, "Oh, draw like draw these characters," or even just taking on commissions, um, trying to find some kind of connection. Like I can draw Wolverine, but I I have no desire to draw a Wolverine comic. 
that's not in me. Um, so it's, it's, and then when I do get approached or art talks to about writing or, or drawing some, some superhero thing, I'm generally not, it, unless I have a key, unless somebody came and said, Hey, Jamie, Legion of superheroes, I'm not I'm probably not going to do it. Yeah. It's, it's harder and harder for me to get interested in it. But I think that the, 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 a nice sense thing to take from that is that we really need, you know, especially if you're young, you need to work on finding, you know, that part in within yourself, you know, like as Eric was saying, like to refine that sensibility to what it is in a project rather than just, oh boy, gee whiz, I'm getting to do this thing to move on to why am I doing this thing? Do I want to do this thing? How can I do this thing to where it's a thing that I want to do? And those be, and that that's a nuanced sort of approach to you know to your your work life, but you have to work find your way into that. I used to teach high schoolers, um, and the the class that I taught at the art center that I was teaching at was essentially a find your style class mm. it was a survey a survey of art class um which i hated that as a term and hated i hated the class on paper it it was very silly um to to be talking to high schoolers who were all in art school <laughs> like how mm. to hold a pencil it, it just seemed redundant so we spent a lot of time just trying to figure out what they wanted to draw individually and and what they wanted to say and and teaching that class really helped me right once you once you teach it you kind of have a, a better understanding on on who you are um but finding out what i wanted to do and uh, i think that i did that book and did the first baboon book at the same time so i was teaching that class and then also workshopping and figuring out uh the baboon Mm -hmm. And it was a great, it was great for me, but also I hope, hopefully great for those students because they were also learning. I would, we would spend every class. I would say, all right, tell me everyone come in with your favorite movie and we're going to talk about your favorite movie yeah. at the end of class or what's your favorite band or who's your favorite artist. And we'll pull them up on, on, the, on the screen. And I, I did that every single, every week we had, they had to come in and, and talk about it because, you know, finding out what you like definitely, uh, or at least it, it is for me, finding out what I like indicates what I want to, to draw or well, I think it's what the, my it's, interests are. It's the, it's the process of sort of being an autodidact to not being an autodidact in the sense of if you can codify your thinking, reasoning, and, and purpose, it, it stops you from just sort of being instinctual about stuff. Like while instinct is great and we need it to make choices, you you have to kind of know what the things are that you're you, that are that are you making choices about. Uh, I just want to just say for the record, Jamie was holding was back finally to his mechanical pencil that he was holding when he first started this podcast. Then he switched to the, the black. I think it's the the Pentel. Um, yeah, and Pentel. And Pentel then he, rolling writer. Then he went to the Micron Pigma pen pen, and then he switched back to the uh, the mechanical pencil. So they're just on my desk. I know. I'm gonna pull out. Here's I like my... I like although I I like that you were switching through these these hand. There you go. Yay. These Here's hand the, big, the big pencil. Yes, big mon grande crayon. We. Oh, yeah. Um All right, well I think we could do this like all the time, but um I think we're going to I'm going to I'm going to save 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 battery power here and I think I'll we'll wrap it up. Um but I really really appreciate both of you oh. and uh and somebody else did on Jamie's side. Um I I I'm always fascinated getting in a conversation with you guys individually and together. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I feel, I feel fortunate to, to know, you know, you both and call you both friend and, um, and Eric, I will be, I will be out in the West coast in the, in the not too distant future. So uh, we have to pass through where you are to get to where we need to go. So I will, uh, 
I will, I will, we will, we will break some bread. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, so December, Age of Bronze 3, through Image, comic book stores, wherever you get a graphic novel and they sell an image, it'll be there. And then in January, the TikTok Man of Oz. Yes. Nice. Finally, thumbs up. And Jamie, what are we, how many more weeks are we looking at here? Uh, tomorrow is two weeks. Two weeks left okay, for weeks. the Baboon, Temple of Eternal Life. Uh, and that will, if everything goes according to plan, that will be shipped out in February. Um, I look forward to getting my copy. That is, yeah. And then it's right on to the third book. So the third book is a collection of all the short story stuff that I've done. Cool. So it's just get something published. Third book is something published that hopefully, you know, if everything goes to plan, it's March, March yeah. of next year, another crowdfunder. Um, and then another, another one in November. There you that's, go. Just, that's the plan is, is there you go. making that shelf happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll put I'll put all the links in the in the in the description below, um, whether you're listening to the podcast or you're watch, watching our our faces. Um, either way, it'll be down below. And then uh, follow follow what these guys are doing because they're both doing some great stuff, and I'm super happy to to be part of it in this really limited fashion. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? What are you reaching for? Is it a gun? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. That's all right. Um, it was perfect timing. Um, thank you both. And um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll, we'll do this again. We'll maybe we'll find we'll find a maybe we'll talk about old time timey uh, artists that we think are cool. Yeah, I could have brought a short stack of books to uh, show stuff, and we didn't even get there. Uh, I know that's because we have we're, we're we're passionate about the things we talk about. <laughs> um, Next time, I promise. All right. Okay, go on too long. Perfect. Anyway, it was great being here. Thank you so much, Alex. I love yeah. talking with you, Jamie. Uh, I will go to Crowdfunder right now. Oh, yeah. lovely. Lovely, go, lovely. Go, lovely. Go All right, guys. Record your book. Have I will a wonderful send week. You the preview. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have a wonderful week. And uh, everybody, we'll see you next week.